right, welcome everyone. Welcome to this program by Studium Generale of the Eindhoven University of Technology. Welcome everyone here in the room and also a very welcome to everyone who is watching via the live stream today. Um, yeah, well, here it is. Um, the IPCC 6th Assessment Report, Part 3, Mitigation of Climate Change. Uh, the report by the United Nations Climate Panel uh, Working Group 3 on tackling climate change and the measures required to achieve it. Um, and the uh, conclusions are very alarming. Uh, we as a global community are not on track at all. If we want to limit global warming to the essential 1.5 degrees, we must immediately and radically limit greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, the coming years will be crucial to comply with the Paris agreements. Um, yeah, this is the, uh, the full report of Working Group 3. Um, it's uh, 3,675 pages, um, printed two-sided. So it's a lot, and it's just Working Group 3, so you also have Working Group 1 and Working Group 2. Um, a report prepared by 65 countries, in which uh, 278 authors and 354 uh, other experts were involved. And, and then this one, this is the summary for policymakers. Um, maybe even more important, um, but it's just 37 pages. Well, uh, the negotiations about the summary uh, took more effort than ever this year, and uh, the agreement was reached three days later than expected. But last Monday, uh, 5 p.m. Central European time, it was finally time for the official press conference. Let's have a look. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and to those watching us from other parts of the, of the world, good evening and good, uh, good morning as well. Uh, my name is Andrei Mahicic, and welcome, I wish to welcome you to this press conference by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The jury has reached a verdict, and it is damning. This report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a litany of broken climate promises. It is a file of shame, cataloging the empty pledges that put us firmly on track towards an unlivable world. We are on a fast track to climate disaster. Major cities underwater, unprecedented heat waves, terrifying storms, widespread water shortages, the extinction of a million species of plants and animals. And this is not fiction or exaggeration. It is what science tells us will result from our current energy policies. We are on a pathway to global warming of more than double the 1.5 degree limit agreed in Paris. Some government and business leaders are saying one thing, but doing another. Simply put, they are lying. But it doesn't have to be this way. Today's report is focused on mitigation, cutting emissions. It sets out viable, financially sound options in every sector that can keep the possibility of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees alive. I am appealing directly to you. Today's report comes at a time of global turbulence. Inequalities are at unprecedented levels. The recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic is scandalously uneven. Inflation is rising, and the war in Ukraine is causing food and energy prices to skyrocket. Climate promises and plans must be turned into reality and action now. <music> Well, this was just a, a short impression of the press conference, of the start of the press conference. Uh, well, 
who of you uh, actually watched the press conference last Monday? One hand, <laughs> very brave, and I know you were involved. So <laughs> a second hand, a third hand. Okay, maybe also people uh, who are now watching the live stream also watched. Um, or maybe uh, you watched uh, the Q&A session afterwards, streamed by the NOS and TU Delft. No one? Okay. Um, well, uh, who of you looked a bit uh, into the report or uh, read about the results in the media? Okay. That's good to see. Uh, at least 50% hands. Um, well, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the Dutch scientists who contributed uh, to this uh, report and uh, who was also involved in the approval of the summary is Professor Helene de Koning. Uh, she's a full professor of socio-technical innovation and climate change uh, here at our university, the TUE. Uh, and she's also uh, an associate professor in innovation studies and sustainability at uh, Radboud University in Nijmegen. Um, and today we will discuss the preparation of the IPCC report, the conclusions, and also the implications for a climate policy. Um, yeah, during the interview, there's also an uh, opportunity for you to ask your questions to Helene, so feel free, and also for the people who are watching the live stream, you can ask your questions in the chat. Um, and uh, my colleague Marle, who is uh, now sitting over there, uh, she will, uh, during the program, she will join us uh, and also bring up the online questions. So, um, well, I'm happy that uh, Helene de Koning is here today with us to share her insights and experiences. Um, so please give her a very warm welcome, Helene de Koning. Welcome, Elaine. Have a seat. Thanks. Good you are here. Um, yeah, the report. Uh, do you have a print yourself? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was pretty. Uh, that, that was about what I was hoping by the, for. By the pile of paper. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's uh, yeah. It's of course not sustainable to print the whole version. <laughs> um, well, I think that the past two weeks were. Uh, uh, yeah, you were entirely devoted to the approval of the report and uh, the many media performances that uh, that followed also. Uh, yeah, must be must have been a very busy, intense, very stressful time the past weeks, right? Or yeah, how did you I experience I, those those I'm days? Stressful? I I don't I don't stress very much, so okay. I'm, I'm lucky that I'm uh, not so susceptible to that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was. Uh, it were, Especially the weeks of the approval, they were very intensive. Uh, as at the start, you know, it was going very slowly, and you saw the governments, you know, their, their difficult points and yeah. intervening and intervening. After the first week, four percent of the text was approved. Yeah, and this especially the uh, summary for policymakers. Oh, the right? summary for policymakers. Yeah. yeah. And so the rest had to be done in the second week, and it had actually never gone so slowly before. So uh, we mm. were worried that we would actually finish in time. But eventually, on Sunday night, two, actually two days after, yeah. it was going to be vote. Yeah, uh, and that was finished. still in time for the press conference that was yeah, it had scheduled to be delayed on the Monday. By, uh, by a couple of hours, but uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, okay. Uh, and, and how many interviews uh, did you give afterwards? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so a many. Yeah. yeah, for television, <laughs> newspapers, uh, also international uh, media, I guess. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating, uh, I guess, to experience how things work. Then. It's very gratifying to see that so many media are picking it up. Yeah. Not yeah. just, I mean, not just for myself, but for all authors involved. Yeah. I have to catch that one. Oh. Yeah, and talking about uh, yeah the media and and things like that. Um, are you happy with the, with the media attention so far? Yeah, in the Netherlands, yes, I think yeah. it's uh, it's very good, and the uh, that the NOS decided to live stream the the, the Q and A or the, in the press conference. I think that's that's great. Yeah, uh, I did hear that in other countries, for instance, even in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, that they did not have the same amount of uh, media attention. Yeah. I thought maybe it's also uh, a bit overshadowed uh, by the by the war in Ukraine. Obviously, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but but still, there was a lot of media attention. Yeah, I mean, normally these IPCC reports, once they come out, they're really headlines all over. Huh? And now the headlines are, of course, uh, yeah. 
uh, going to the, the horrific events yeah. in, uh, in the Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, and the, the presenters of the press conference, did they do a good job? I, I really like what Guterres is, uh, is saying. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, he's I can really show the audience uh, who were involved. Right. Some, who are these, these people uh, just generally? Actually, the only ones I know are the ones associated with the IPCC, so Abdallah and, uh, and Hussun Lee, the, the secretary and the chair of the IPCC as a whole. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm mainly involved in uh, working group three, so I yeah. mainly know the leadership of that. Those uh, three. Yeah. yeah, so Jim and uh, uh, Diana and uh, yeah, Ramon. Yeah. 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 The, so the they, important uh, persons. Well, in, in they're, the they're end. part of the bureau, so the leadership of working group three. There are more people who are also uh, very much involved in the uh, in the approval, but these were the ones who were uh, who were speaking at the press conference. Yeah. 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 And well, let's have a look at the numbers. Uh, I also uh, already mentioned it in my introduction. Uh, 278 authors, uh, 65 countries, and. Uh, Maybe uh, also an interesting one, more than 18,000 scientific papers uh, have been reviewed and also uh, the, the, the scientists received well, uh, more than uh, uh, 59,000 review comments. That's really a lot. Yeah, so uh, I'll explain the process a yeah. little bit. So the IPCC is an uh, international organization, so it's governed by countries. Mm -hmm. So the countries are members of IPCC and they decide in UN meetings on what, what happens. Uh, also whether reports get approved, but also whether they actually get written. And they decide on the outline of the reports. Now, after they decide on the outline, authors are selected, the report is written and it goes through two review rounds, one mm -hmm. by experts only and one by experts and governments. And those are the review rounds that uh, lead to those comments. And the rule is that we uh, have to uh, take every comment and address it. So we get this enormous okay. Excel file with all the comments and who made the comment and then we fill out what the response will be and of course we implement it in the, in the report. So all these 59 uh, and more comments have got an individual response by yeah. uh, one of those uh, 200 something uh, authors. And the rule there is that, so the IPC has one mantra, it is policy relevant but not policy prescriptive. So okay. we don't do research, we only assess the literature, the peer reviewed literature preferably, mm -hmm. so not, you know, uh, NGO or company reports, but really stuff that's been published in scientific papers. That's the only, uh, that's our main source of information. Okay. And that's what we bring together. Yeah. So if a comment is like, uh, you haven't uh, looked at nuclear well enough uh, because you're writing this, then if the commenter doesn't provide a literature reference, uh, and we cannot find any information in the peer-reviewed literature that uh, affirms that point, mm -hmm. then we can uh, reject that comment uh, yeah. because it's not based on the scientific literature. And that's also sort of the safeguard uh -huh. against too much political involvement ah, okay. in the yeah. IPCC reports. Because if a, government, if a government says, uh, you know, take this out because you know, we don't like it, uh, that you're saying that we have to cut meat consumption or something, yeah. Uh, if the literature says we have to do this or we cannot make the, the climate targets, then we, we have to accept it and we can ignore the government's uh, comments. Mm. Okay, yeah, that, very tough job to do. Yeah, yeah, but it's all, I mean, there's really a safeguard that is based on the scientific literature. And uh, uh, yeah, and there's of course, there is interaction between the politics and the science, but mm -hmm. in principle, uh, we're supposed to make sure that it doesn't go too far, at least. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, well, without going uh, directly now into the, to the details, um, what are for you the most important uh, conclusions and also uh, elements of this, of this specific report? Yeah, so what I was, maybe ma most relieved about <laughs> was yeah. that we still have a chance to limit warming to one and a half degrees because I was also involved in an earlier report on mm -hmm. limiting warming to one and a half degrees and beyond that the the, the impacts are really dire. Yeah. So every chance we still have to limit warming to one and a half degrees we should we should yeah, take. So and yeah, so it's, are, it's, yeah. getting, it's getting tight, right? We uh, basically have to peak global emissions in the next three years or so, or it's really getting out of reach. Yeah. 
I also um, heard your, your colleague uh, Detlef van Vuren saying it's it's not five to twelve, it's one to twelve. But but I was already thinking maybe it's already far past twelve. But you're saying it's. Yeah, I mean, his modeling, uh, as well as more bottom-up studies, yeah. uh, indicate that it's still possible. So yeah. that's, that's a message of hope. But yeah. it's, it is, at the same time, very clear that we need to take immediate action. And it's n we cannot wait for another five years to, to start living. Another five living. years. So that's, that's really short term then. Uh, yeah, I mean, as I said, we have to yeah. peak global emissions before 2025. Mm -hmm. It's now 2022. Yeah. So that's very quick, actually also for two degree scenarios. Uh, and then we have to sort of half global emissions by 2030. Yeah. Globally, and yeah, not just in the Netherlands mm. or rich countries, but globally. And be n yeah, net zero greenhouse gas emissions uh, yeah, in the years right after 2050. Yeah, maybe we can go more into detail uh, later on, then we can also show a graph and, and discuss that. Yeah. The other really key message I think is that, that the the action needed for that. I mean, we've never known so much about what is needed and, and how we can actually achieve it. We have much more insights from behavioral sciences, from innovation sciences, from transition studies yeah. that informs the decisions that have to be taken. And I think that is also the, the, the good news because earlier it was just a list of you know, technologies and options and maybe economic instruments to implement it. But now we know much more about the other intricacies and other options that we have to uh, to drive these transitions that are needed. Yeah. And that, that, the last thing was also uh, your uh, contribution, right? Or in, yeah, in the, the topic of my uh, chapter, yeah. chapter 16, was uh, yeah, the official title is Innovation, Technology Development and Transfer. Yeah. So it was uh, around everything related to innovation and what you can expect of that and how you can think of that. And that really goes into this transition literature. But it was also about what is needed in terms of international cooperation on technology uh, and also on capacity building uh, in developing countries uh, and, and how you can uh, collaborate internationally on that. Yeah. Okay, so and this is uh, the report of Working Group 3. Um, the, the, the first one uh, was uh, the report with the uh, uh, physical science basis, and the second one was about impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. Um, can you say that this is, in the end, the, the most important one, or because it's about what we can do? Or I, th I mean, uh, they're all important. They're all building blocks the of the story. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that this one is probably the most politically uh, relevant one okay yeah. because uh, and that's you saw that as well in the approval that it was harder to approve the summary for policymakers which is approved by all governments on a sort of sentence by sentence basis mm -hmm. uh, and you could see the controversy because it was really touching on the yeah on the on the policies of countries themselves what we were saying based on the science affected or ought to affect how they uh, run their own economies. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, the I big interests are starting to play a role, and you do notice that in, uh, in what kind of words they want in or what kind of messages they want the, the report to send. Yeah, so, so uh, maybe uh, when, the, when the first and the second uh, reports were published, the, the policy makers lay back still a little bit, but now it's very concrete what solutions, uh, what solutions could be and what they can do. So now they are really confronted with the fact they, that they have to take action. Yeah, I guess, I mean, as I said, IPCC is policy relevant but not policy prescriptive, so we cannot say Dear governments, you have to do this. Okay, yeah. But we can say if you want, want to limit warming to one and a half degrees, this is the consequence for the emissions in these years. How can you achieve these emission reductions? Well, through these and these measures, and we can say something about the feasibility of those measures and how to bring about these transitions. Mm -hmm. so yeah. And then, indeed, you get into the uh, yeah, what governments uh, can actually do. Yeah. And can you tell us a bit more about um, you, uh, you are involved since uh, been involved since uh, 2002? Uh, you already. Uh, wrote other papers and uh, yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, how, yeah, so how uh, things work and 
how yeah, the contributions so work. Early on, I was more involved in the uh, as part of the technical support unit, which is sort of a technical secretariat of the reports. So they're also involved in this report, but they, they work more on the background, they arrange all the processes, and, uh, and that's how I got really, uh, that's how, why I know very well how the IPCC <laughs> uh, on the inside works. Mm -hmm. um, and then later on, I, uh, as, uh, I, I became more of an author and... Uh, and a, and a scientist in the process. But is it possible for every scientist, also people maybe here in the room, to, to become an author? Or? Yeah, what, what you need to do is you need to be nominated by your own government. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, generally there's an IPCC focal point in every country. In the Netherlands it's uh, with the KNMI. Uh, and you, uh, yeah, they sort of submit your CV. And then eventually the IPCC uh, leadership decides who will be invited to be an author. Yeah. And they do that on the basis of, of course, expertise, uh, geographical distribution, because it's very important to have authors from all over the world so that not, you don't get specific mm. perspectives only in the report, and that different language areas are covered. Uh, and, of course, they look at uh, gender and also on whether people are actually yeah, sort of able to operate a little bit in this, uh, in this context of, of writing a report like this. What I found interesting was that uh, Mr. Gutierrez, in his uh, speech, he uh, mentioned the, uh, the importance of the three Vs. Uh, I, I, did you hear that? Or he, he, was, uh, he praised the voluntary efforts of scientists. So I thought, is it all voluntary then? Or so the IPCC doesn't pay uh, okay. their authors. They only cover the costs, the travel costs of developing country authors. Uh, mm. the, so my costs are, uh, my travel costs, which were not so high because we had to go online, obviously, mm -hmm. um, were covered by the Dutch government. Uh, so developed countries uh, okay. cover their own author's costs. And of course, yeah, the institution where I work, so Eindhoven University has, has to sort of, yeah, try to free up some time to, to do the work. But, I mean, he's right that a lot of authors work very long hours in order to, uh, well beyond their normal jobs, in order to make this happen. And that's, that, that is tough, right? Because you do, we all do have a, a job next to it and we have to yeah. teach and uh, do research and do other things. So, yeah, that's sometimes a challenge. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but generally it's the institutions helping uh, the authors because yeah. they also see it as valuable. Okay, that way, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, looking at time, time flies already. Um, do you want to explain uh, a bit more about IPCC, or shall we go further with? Let's uh, go to the content. Huh, if we, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> if we look at this graph, could you, uh, yeah, could you guide us uh, through this graph maybe a bit more? Yeah. So the lower one. You can one use uh, the the pointer if you like. But yeah, no, I don't think necessary. I need it. The the lower one is uh, is the development of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions since 1990. So if you look at the blue, uh, so you see obviously a line going up. Uh, the blue is the CO2 emissions from fossil fuels and uh, and industry. So that's the the biggest uh, chunk. And then there's also CO2 from uh, uh, land use. That's the yellow. And then you see that big red one, that's methane emissions, also coming a lot from land use, but also the fossil fuel industry. And finally, nitrous oxide and the fluorinated gases are two other uh, groups of, uh, of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So you see that the, uh, they've been increasing also in the past uh, decade, though less fast in the past decade than the decade before. The, the 2000 to 2010 decade was particularly fast because that was the uh, that coincided with a very fast economic growth, fueled mainly by coal, especially in East Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, but you see that actually, even in the the decade of the Paris Agreement, emissions are still uh, going up uh, at the rate of uh, about one or one and a half percent uh, per year. And actually, that last decade is in absolute numbers the largest increase uh, ever. The, the um, largest ever. Yeah, yeah. Because, because it's coming from a... Uh, the relative increase is lower, but it's coming from a higher base, so the, the absolute increase is, uh, is, is, is bigger. Um, it is clear that emissions have been avoided because but of policies, but it's, uh, but it's clearly not yet leading to a peaking of, uh, of emissions. Uh, yeah. yeah, then I should say then it's even harder to, to uh, yeah, turn it... 
turn the it around. The other way, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the other graph is, uh, is the, the, so this is the past. The other graph is the future. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, or up until uh, sort of the year now is uh, is past, but the uh, the rest are projections of how emissions would have to go if we want to limit warming to certain temperature levels. So the the light blue one at the bottom is an emission path that is consistent with uh, one and a half degrees, a 50 percent chance of having no or limited overshoot of one and a half degrees of, uh, of warming compared to pre-industrial. And then there's a couple of other paths. And the, the red one is actually if the currently implemented policies would, would continue, we would sort of uh, um, yeah, look at, uh, at uh, temperature rises that, that are more in the, like three degrees or maybe a little bit more. I don't think it will go that far because we, we are seeing changes in the energy system. So I, I think we're, we're sort of, uh, I mean, the IPCC doesn't assign likelihoods to scenarios. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, it doesn't look like we will see three degrees of warming. I think the actually innovation and the unattractiveness of coal and everything is uh, is going to stop that uh, already. Okay. But, but, are, are yeah. we but we're not on the, we're not on a one and a half degree path. Actually, if we wait for the plans for which have been submitted to Paris to be implemented, um, we're we're not not even close. So those plans definitely need to get more ambitious. If but we closer uh, maybe then to that. Purple or green line, or yeah, the purple or or green between the red and the yeah, sort of between that, I would say, yeah. Between yeah. red and purple, yeah. maybe, or red yeah, and green. Yeah, the purple is uh, is the purple is assuming that we would limit warming to two degrees, mm -hmm. but that we we would implement the national plans submitted to the Paris Agreement still, and then wait, and then have more stronger policies, so that means you would still have high emissions for a bit and then have to go down very And the quickly. Paris Agreement was in? 2015. Yeah, 2015, yeah. 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 So the, the, yeah, the point here is that the, you, you work with a carbon budget, right? So we have sort of an, an amount of CO2 that we can add to the atmosphere uh, in order to, uh, and if we go above that, we, we get a temperature rise higher than one and a half degrees. And at the moment, that, that carbon budget will be depleted in, in eight or nine years or so. Yeah. So um, every year that we keep on adding the same amount of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, we are depleting that budget. So every year, that every ton that we reduce earlier, a year mm -hmm. earlier, uh, we are not depleting that budget. And actually, yeah, we don't have to take out of the atmosphere yeah. later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And well, in, in all the interviews, you and your colleagues... Um, you stated that a far-reaching transformation of energy supply, industry, transport, and agriculture is needed. Um, well, there's a lot to tell about that. Uh, maybe uh, let's focus on uh, technology and innovation. Um, yeah, what 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 are the options? What uh, is needed to be done? What? Yeah, so this, this this statement about these system transformations. What we mean with that? Mm -hmm is that it's not enough to implement only technologies, right? It's not if we have a bunch of solar and winds and we keep the rest of the energy system the same, we will not get there. Um, you, you also need to limit your energy demand. You need to adjust your uh, regulatory systems. People need to maybe think differently about energy. Maybe you need to have different types of buildings or smaller housing or mm -hmm. uh, different urban um, settlements uh, and, and policies, etc. So that, 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 that's what we mean with a system transformation. Yeah. So that also means that innovation in itself is not enough. It needs to be accompanied by behavior change, by a different financial system, by uh, policy instruments, by a different education, and that also relates to the role of universities, for yeah. instance. But Gutierrez said, uh, we are not on track. Is, is TUE on, tr on track? Uh, are the Netherlands on track? Uh, so, yeah, it doesn't look like the Netherlands is on track. Uh, the, the current, the new government has made the plans more ambitious, it looks mm -hmm. like, although the plans are not quite clear yet. Uh, but what I've seen in the past is, is very clear that the um, yeah that that they're still sort of in this frame of we're going to implement a bunch of technologies and that's going uh, going to solve our our problems without really looking at the attributes of the system. So I, I, mm. uh, when I speak to politicians and I'm going to talk to the some members of parliament this yeah. afternoon, we really okay. always emphasize well you need to really focus on these systems 
transitions rather than individual measures and, and technology in itself is, uh, is never enough. Yeah. Um, let's have a look here in the room. Uh, someone who has a question for Elaine. Um, yeah, Sverre, you can come with the mic and give the mic to the person here in front. And my colleague will also join us with the <laughs> questions from the live stream. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, nice. Could you give an example of a system change? Yeah, an, an example is, for instance, our transportation system. Um, right now, if you look at the policies, there's a little bit of policy on public transport, and uh, if I talk about the Netherlands, uh, and, and non-motorized transport, etc. But it's really most of the funding is going into uh, basically keeping the car infrastructure as it is. Uh, and replacing the 8 million you know, uh, gasoline cars we have right now with 8 million uh, electric vehicles. Uh, and that's not a system change, right? That is, uh, that is a pure technological policy and keeping everything the same. What would be a system change is if you look at, okay, well, how, are, how, how do people actually live in, in, in cities and outside of cities? Uh, what does that mean? What could that mean for the... Uh, the transport system, could we do more with um, um, biking and, and walking and other uh, forms of active transport? Uh, could you do more with, with public transport? What does that mean for the business models of the industries that are supplying? The, the, uh, what does that mean for IT, for, um, uh, for, for regulation, for urban planning, etc.? You're going, and, and for human behavior, you know, is it still a, the social norm now is to own a car? The default is to transport yourself by car. Uh, and that, that's also, social norms change slowly, but we know they can change. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so, and then you're, you're really thinking about a, a more of a system change. Okay. Marla, maybe you have a, a question from the online audience. We do. We have uh, several questions, both about the content of the report and the process itself. But perhaps uh, one question um, that ties in a little bit with this about the system changes is um, the perspective of developing countries and underdeveloped countries. Uh, someone comments the dilemmas for those governments lies uh, between energy access and energy transition. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, the, uh, the report is actually very clear on that. Uh, we, we discussed it extensively. The, um, first of all, uh, energy access, even if you would do it with fossil fuels, uh, it's not going to lead to a huge increase in emissions because the energy demand of especially poor and vulnerable people is, is so low that actually even if you would do it completely with fossil fuels, it would maybe add a percent or something to global emissions. So that's not, that's not a reason not to do it. Uh, we also very much conclude that sustainable development across the board and mitigation, they need each other. Right? You, it's going to be very hard to achieve your sustainable development goals without climate change mitigation and the other way around. Climate change mitigation without observing sustainable development very broadly mm -hmm. is, uh, is, is not good uh, mitigation. So we're very, uh, very clear on that, that those things need to go hand in hand. So uh, if a government is, uh, is, uh, has to prioritize, it really needs to look at where the synergies are and, and try to focus on that and, and those increasingly are there with the, the measures that we can, uh, we can take. So. Maybe they could even take shortcuts because they can go straight to the new technology, or is that Yeah, but there's also issues with that, and that's yeah. what we discuss extensively in our chapter. I'm looking at Clara, who's actually also doing research on that. Um, the, it's not so easy, because what we see right now is that most of the innovation is happening in, uh, the technological innovation is happening in developed countries. And even if you want to implement those technologies in developing countries, you often run up against uh, issues of capacity and you create basically new dependencies. So the developing countries get again dependent on foreign suppliers, but now for, for different matters. And their own economies don't necessarily benefit from that change. And that needs to change in order to make, to get public support for those transitions in, in all countries in the world, all countries need to have like an economic benefit out mm -hmm. of that transition. Yeah. So if you want that leapfrogging frogging to happen, uh, you, you really need to build capacity locally and, and they also need to be able to manage their own transition on their own terms. Okay, thanks. Okay, someone else here in the room who has a question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so maybe this is a too general to answer, but 
Um, what is the effect of urbanization? Is that a net positive? Or the a effect of negative? urbanization. Yeah, there's a whole chapter on yeah. urban systems in the report, so that's a good question. <laughs> um, we see that the, the emissions of urban areas are the fastest rising, so they've been rising very, very quickly. Uh, urban area areas are, so they're, they're high emitting areas. They have a huge material consumption, uh, you know, you have to import all your food, etc. So it's not necessarily good for climate change mitigation. However, there's also opportunities in urban areas because often the transport needs uh, are lower or can be met with uh, easier, with low emission uh, options. Um, so um, it, it really, I mean, you can do, you can get urbanization right <laughs> and make uh, livable cities that are also good for climate change mitigation, and you can get it wrong, and they're unlivable cities and bad for climate change mitigation. So it really depends on how you on how you how you go about it. We have, we have uh, a big housing problem in the Netherlands. Did the government already uh, took the right steps, or? What? Yeah. So the report doesn't say anything about the housing problem in the yeah. Netherlands. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> But <laughs> so if I stay very close to the report, I wouldn't know an answer. Yeah. But if you ask me, um, I think the housing the housing problem is a is not only a problem of quantity of houses, right? It's also we have the wrong houses, right? We have way more one-family houses, and we have m many more one-person families at the moment. So we have the wrong type of houses for for our population, and it's only going to go more that way in the in the future. Yeah. So and and. And in the Netherlands, we have a very high floor space per person, much higher even than Germany, for instance. Oh yeah. So we're uh, actually about 50% higher. So if you if you look at you know. And, and uh, small houses is better. Yeah, it's, it's, it's small that's houses what you're use yeah. less materials, less energy, uh, and uh, and you can also build them more closely together, so you lower your transport needs. So there's a lot of advantages to smaller okay. floor space. Uh, mm. So yeah, being creative about how to solve the housing problem can also help uh, climate change, uh, yeah. both adaptation and mitigation. So these problems are not uh, unconnected. Yeah. Marla, do we have other Thank online you. questions? Or? Yeah, there are various questions, but um, some of them uh, are, are concerned with, uh, with the one and a half degrees and how feasible that is. So one question is, what would the IPCC do if, uh, if or in this case you, if you would learn that uh, it would go to two degrees instead of one and a half? What would, what would change? For Policy-wise, or yeah, so IPCC doesn't make policies, so the yeah, we only assess the science, <laughs> <laughs> and we don't even advise because we can't be policy prescriptive. But um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's it's going to be very hard to make the one and a half degrees, right? The changes are very very big. We can yeah. still do it, but yeah, it, it requires a lot of uh, immediate action. Um, I mean, if we go to two degrees, you will see, uh, if that ends up the result, you will see much bigger uh, adaptation needs, so investments in, in that. However, what I hope is that we're not going to focus on a single <laughs> uh, temperature target. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, one and a half is better than 1.6, but 1.6 is better than 1.7. No. So I would say try to focus on the one and a half degrees, get as close as you as can. Close to, yeah. Uh, uh, and 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 then you know be, if we haven't made it, focus on 1.7. That doesn't. That's not going to help us very no. much, I think. Okay. Uh, time is almost up, but maybe uh, there are things you would like to mention still. Uh, that that you. I'd actually like to. Yeah, uh, still I think there are more questions, so let's keep the. <laughs> one or two last questions. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe switch to the other side. The <laughs> yeah, it's a catch box, so you have to catch it. <laughs> yeah, you're the, the lucky one, so go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was wondering if the report uh, discusses or, or investigates the... Uh, Can you hold it closer? Oh, of course. If, if the report discusses any strategies to deal with the increased um, anti-climate policy extremization we've been seeing and misinformation that is um, gaining more traction, sadly, these days. Yeah, I think the report discusses that somewhere. I don't think it ended up in the summary for policymakers. So I'm actually not sure what the answer to the question is. I'd have to uh, look it up. Sorry about that. It's all right. I haven't read all 3,000 pages. <laughs> Perhaps a slightly similar question online is 
how, uh, more of a geopolitical question, I guess, uh, how to work on this with countries like Russia and China that are perhaps more yeah, anti-climate so change. The, um, so like in the IPCC and also in the UNFCCC, countries work together, right? You try to get the, the it's all, these processes are by consensus, so in principle you treat everybody the same. I mean, and also in the IPCC approval, of course China was there, Russia was there, um, Ukraine was there, uh, and they all negotiate on the same uh, mm. uh, uh, terms. Um, I think, I mean, China is definitely a, a very collaborative country. They have a, quite an ambitious climate policy and they usually exceed what they promise. So that, that is very hopeful. And also China stands a lot to gain from the, the transitions given their, their sort of technological situation. Um, in, in Russia, that's more of a classical uh, fossil fuel exporter, uh, a very large one actually. And you also see that in their positions in the climate change uh, debate. Yeah. At the same time, they're quite vulnerable to climate change as well uh, in, in some areas. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Elaine, for answering all these questions for now. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we have to end up this session because also some students need to go to other classes and other projects and things like that. So uh, thank you very much. Um, Maybe yeah. you can come up to the front. It's a, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a huge challenge uh, uh, we are facing, but uh, yeah, I. As you started, uh, you are a bit hopeful still. Um, I have no choice. Sorry? I have no choice. You have no choice. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, for now, th thank you very much for uh, yeah, explaining all these things and answering the questions. So, please, uh, warm applause again for Helene de Koning. <laughs>